Hi, I'm John Mather, Nobel Prize Laureate and Senior Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA, and you're listening to The Soul of Life. Dr. Tammy Nelson is an erotic recovery expert. She's a leading expert on infidelity and the healing of sexual relationships. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak with Dr. Nelson about what it takes to have a vibrant sex life with a monogamous partner and how cheating during COVID has taken on new proportions. If I am, you know, a mom stuck home, homeschooling my kids, and I've been in my yoga pants for seven months and haven't worn makeup and my my life is about Cheerios and trying to figure out algebra, and then I meet someone online who thinks I'm like sexy and alive and charming and beautiful and, you know, just wants to make out with me. Like, I'm a totally different person for 10 minutes a day, and that makes you feel alive for those 10 minutes. Dr. Nelson is the author of Getting the Sex You Want and The New Monogamy, Redefining Your Relationship After Infidelity. We talk about the mindset that's required to prevent or recover from infidelity and why it can be an opportunity. There's really several phases of recovery after an affair. So if people are coming in during the crisis, you know, they don't want to hear that this is a great thing, but they do uh, identify with the idea that this is usually like a wake up or break up moment. Tammy says the key to a new monogamy that can survive infidelity is to see the big picture and how you fit into it, something that the stress and intense emotions of the crisis often cloud. You know, when you're having an affair, it's not that you are necessarily looking for someone else, you're looking to be someone else. So if we look at like, who did you become in that affair instead of, you know, why did you cheat on the person that you're with? Then we have a totally different narrative that both people can understand and look at a little bit differently. The work that people like Tammy and I do as couples therapists treating infidelity usually has to include treating the symptoms of trauma, anxiety, depression, and often substance abuse, as well as grief. But Tammy says that the upside to this work is hope and opportunity to have the marriage and sexual relationship that you want. You have to be able to create a new marriage going forward because once someone cheats, the reality is that marriage is over. And I mean, people don't want to hear that, but the monogamy agreement that you made pretty much has one rule. <laughs> that rule is like, don't sleep with anyone else. Like, that's pretty much it. That's all you got. You have to, both of you, grieve that. And that's over, that ended. And then you get to decide, do you want a new marriage together going forward? We discussed several myths about infidelity, sex, and eroticism. You know, there's so many myths about women needing emotional connection and men just wanting, you know, objectified sex. And frankly, it's not true. Women actually do cheat for sex. Men tend to cheat for emotional reasons. And that, like, flips the whole paradigm of what we think about. Do all affairs happen because of sexual problems? Does communication and empathy have the power to fix sexual frustration? If we work on our companionship and we get really close and we communicate well and we go to therapy and learn how to talk to each other, then our sex life will just take care of itself. And that's totally not true. Why does emotional closeness sometimes kill erotic passion? The longer you're together in a relationship, you would think the more comfortable you are sharing your desires and your fantasies but it actually works the opposite because the more you're together, the safer you feel and the more family you feel. And you, know, you don't want to have sex with your family so that, you know, it actually decreases and desexualizes your relationship. Why is it important to tease apart safety and trust to have a hot sex life? Safety and trust are different. So you do have to trust your partner to go to those places, those edges of your erotic desires. Um, so that you can push your own edge, you know, so you, you can explore those places without, uh, without feeling shame or risking shame. And you do have to trust that person, but you don't have to feel safe. And there's a difference because in really good sex, you shouldn't feel sick. You should feel like kind of embarrassed and you should feel like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. And I can't believe I made that noise. And I can't believe I was that person. And the only way to do that is to feel like you're in a sort of trusting environment. What's the problem with the monogamous relationship where one partner is taking sex off the table? One of the things you commit to when you're committing to marriage or monogamy is to be sexual partners. 
and that if you're not going to have sex with your partner, it's not okay to hold them hostage and say, well, I don't want to have sex with you, but you can't have sex with anyone else either. And finally, I asked Tammy about a term that many therapists and sex therapists have adopted to refer to themselves as being sex positive. And she explains that this term comes from the belief that sexual desire and sexuality are valuable and healthy and belong in romantic relationships. It means that apart from abusive, hurtful, out of control, or self-destructive behaviors, there's no inherently right or wrong flavors of sexuality. Normal is a setting on the washing machine. It doesn't really mean anything. There's a range of sexual behaviors that has nothing to do with what we think is okay. Welcome to season two, episode four of The Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is The New Monogamy. Even Oprah calls it her vajayjay. Oh I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is the soul of life. Please take the time now to subscribe to the soul of life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. That's the best way to make sure you don't miss out on these amazing episodes planned for season two. Dr. Tammy Nelson is a sex and relationship expert, author, and psychotherapist, and she's the director of the Integrative Sex Therapy Institute. In addition to being a university teacher, she's a TEDx speaker and is the host of the podcast called The Trouble with Sex. Tammy is a board-certified sexologist, an ASECT certified sex therapist, a licensed professional counselor, a certified Imago counselor, and a licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselor. She's a prolific author, and in fact, she's a writing and publishing coach, if anyone out there wants to work on their writing and get a book published. And she's published books on infidelity, finding sexual passion, overcoming sexual inhibitions, and teenage eating disorders. Most recently, Tammy published a textbook on sex and couples therapy, and perhaps her best-known book is called Getting the Sex You Want, a nod to Harville Hendrix's perennial bestseller, now I think in its fourth decade on the bestseller list called Getting the Love You Want. Tammy's website is a clearinghouse of information that I highly recommend for everyone in relationship recovery or anyone seeking to master or recover sexual intimacy and so much more. Tammy, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, you're welcome. It's really a privilege to to be with you. You've, I think, you deserve a lot of credit for you know. I, I've known you at least through your work and your in your books for many many years as a couples therapist myself, and um, you've done a lot. I think to get the word out there that, in a, such a helpful way about infidelity, especially and your passion and for teaching about sex. Um, and I've taken your courses at the Sex Integrative Sex Therapy Institute, which is fantastic. So today we'll you know hope to cover some of these things. There's a lot to talk about, but um, I guess I want to ask you kind of um, the question I, I have on my mind about infidelity. People during uh, COVID, you know, in, people come to me for infidelity quite a bit, as I'm sure they do for you. It's one of the big reasons couples seek counseling. And, uh, you know, we have a unique perspective, Tammy, I guess, I think, and I know I, I share this with you, that we get to see affairs as an opportunity for change and for growth and to unlock something that, that's trying to happen in the relationship. Most people don't see it that way at all. I wonder uh, what your perspective is, especially during, during COVID. How, are, how is COVID affecting infidelity? We'll start with that. Well, I agree with you. And you certainly can't tell couples, no, this is great. It's so good that this happened to you. No. <laughs> so exciting time. What an exciting time. <laughs> no, that goes over like a lead balloon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, there's really several phases of recovery after an affair. So if people are coming in during the crisis. You know, they don't want to hear that this is a great thing. But they do uh, identify with the idea that this is usually like a wake-up or break-up moment. And that uh, if they're coming into therapy and they're lasting, you know, more than a couple of weeks, then they're usually in the next phase of recovery, which is like the insight phase, where they can do that work that you're talking about where they can see, okay, how is this 
an opportunity for us to make some changes and to see maybe we're heading down the wrong path and there's the, you know, there's an opportunity to do things differently. And, you know, that's a lot of hard work. You know, you could do the work before you crash and burn and you're in a crisis, but when you have that much pain, you know, pain is such a good motivator to change. Unfortunately, we sometimes wait until we're falling apart to do the repair stuff. And, you know, your question about COVID, um, the uh, website, Ashley Madison, you know, that people sign up to uh, have an affair. That's the sole purpose of going on that website. (laughs) Their uh, signups increased from... Uh, 13,000 people a day signing up to 17,000 people a day signing up since COVID. Wow, not a surprise. Yeah, so I mean, there's a... And I don't know how many people have actually met as a result of those signups. You know, people are more hesitant, as you know, to meet in person. But I think that's interesting that people are still shopping, <laughs> shopping for for some kind of thrill of meeting someone outside of their relationship. And so... <clears throat> You know, to me that I I think this is what I make up is that we have this part of our brain that is activated by seeking behaviors. And since we've been in sort of lockdown for almost a year, I mean, nine months or whatever it's been, that seeking behavior is sort of frustrated in some people. Like some people are nesters and they're okay staying home and making sourdough bread and, (laughs) you know, whatever. But the uh, uh, other people are more seekers and that seeking behavior that we would normally use to like seek out a movie or a parking space or a new restaurant or, you know, something in the environment where we could sort of scan the environment for new stuff. Like how many, how many Netflix movies can you watch? Like I think I've yeah. watched every single thing on Netflix now, every series, like now I'm going into the archives and it's boring. Like you're kind of <laughs> saying that there's a depletion, right? There's a maybe like a dopamine depletion. And we know like people are more depressed. The the I've talked about this on the show. I, I know you've probably talked about it. People are more depressed um, during this during this period. So it makes sense that people are that we're gonna see some of those behaviors that are symptomatic of a of a issue in a relationship, like going outside the marriage or going outside the commitment. And and I don't I don't think it's necessarily a sign that marriages aren't doing well. I think it's really a sign that people are looking for that seeking hit. And so, you know, like those people on Ashley Madison, they might be just looking to get that hit of meeting someone new or flirting or the excitement of doing something illicit and, you know, naughty or whatever, but they're not necessarily even meeting new people. And so I think that's a new thing that's happened as a for COVID. Like, you know, you've been in your pajamas for eight months and you know, you haven't worn shoes. And yet, you know, you could put on that upper face to meet someone new online. You know, there's something about that that is uh, changing who we are as people, I think. It's interesting. Right. I, I love what you said about it's, it's not necessarily a sign that, you know, there's a problem. And I wonder if we can dive into that a little, Tammy. I think for people who may be listening who are struggling with infidelity or have in the past or even in, in their, you know, they've been, their family has been touched by it. Somehow maybe it's their parents. Right. Who, who uh, you know split because of uh, an affair? Um, can we can you say more about why you you take the view and why we take the view as couples therapists that that you know this is this may not be a bad thing? Well, I don't know if it's not a bad thing. I think it's always a hurtful thing. Um, but if we look at it from a more analytic point, I think you know when you're having an affair, it's not that you are necessarily looking for someone else. You're looking to be someone else. And that doesn't make it better for the person who's being cheated on. You know, betrayal is, you feel really shamed when you're betrayed. Shame and betrayal go together. But if you look at the person who ha- who's doing the cheating, it's really about them trying to become a different person, trying to be someone else. And so if we look at like who did you become in that affair instead of, you know, why did you cheat on the person that you're with? Then we have a totally different narrative 
that both people can understand and look at a little bit differently. Because if I am, you know, a mom stuck home, homeschooling my kids, and I've been in my yoga pants for seven months and haven't worn makeup, and my my life is about Cheerios and trying to figure out algebra, and then I meet someone online who thinks I'm like sexy and alive and charming and beautiful and, you know, just wants to make out with me. Like I'm a totally different person for 10 minutes a day. And that makes you feel alive for those 10 minutes. That has really nothing to do with whether or not you love your partner. Um, I was just talking to someone, I had a client right before this who said, and I wrote it down because I thought it was so good. They said, you know, I always feel better when I have an outside partner. It makes me feel closer to my primary partner because the more uh, my ability to get close to someone goes up, the more I can get closer to everyone. Right. I thought that was so interesting. Yeah. And, and we know, don't we, that our brains literally, like in, new romance makes us high, right? There's a lot of research about the brain chemicals being released in romantic attraction, that phase. A lot of us don't realize it's a phase or we, we think we can keep, we can stay in that phase forever. And that may be the challenge. Um. Or we don't care, right? We don't care if it's temporary. It feels so good that it's like, whatever. It's yeah. fine. It's worth the sacrifice. Yeah, if you're using an affair or you, you know, subconsciously at least, you know, parts of you are trying to get relief, right, from something, from pain, from some sort of suffering, you don't care. You're just going to jump out of that second floor <laughs> window. <Right. laughs> See how this goes. Um, how do you begin to help people, um, you know, kind of open up and stabilize, you know, I know it's a big question. I know you teach courses on this that, that lasts, you know, an entire semester and you could write a whole book on this, but how, do, how do you begin to enter into the relationship and constructively, you know, stabilize and begin to create some semblance of pacing and, and order in the conversations when, when somebody's had an affair? Well, first of all, um, people are not going to stay in their marriage or come back to their marriage unless it's worth it. You know, people don't stay just out of duty and responsibility for a long period of time. Like if they, if you're just staying because you're supposed to, um, eventually you're going to cheat again or the marriage is going to fall apart. So you have to be able to create a new marriage going forward because once someone cheats, the reality is that marriage is over. And I mean, people don't want to hear that, but the monogamy agreement that you made pretty much has one rule. <laughs> that rule is like, don't sleep with anyone else. Like, that's pretty much it. That's all you got. You know, it's not a big responsibility. Like, don't cheat on me and stay together till you die. And so if you blow that one rule, like that's pretty much you broke the contract and that marriage is over. So the vision that you had of how this was supposed to end um. <clears throat> It, you know, is crushed. And so you have to, both of you, grieve that. And that's over, that ended. And then you get to decide, do you want a new marriage together going forward? Because if you try to go back to the old marriage, you know, and you try to go back to before this happened, then you're just going to end up here again. And I think for a lot of couples, that's, that's really the first step. And it's a relief. It's like, okay, well, good. Because obviously it wasn't working in the way that we needed it to work or else we wouldn't be here. And so as much as that's painful, it's also like, oh, thank God, we don't have to do that again. Right, it's a, it has to be thought of as a new relationship. Your book is titled The New Monogamy, Redefining Your Relationship After Infidelity. You're not talking about having an open marriage or so, okay, it's, now that it's open, you know, that's, that's not the new monogamy you're necessarily talking about, right? You're talking about uh, redefining it in a way that's that that takes care of what the affair was trying to make happen. And it's creating a new relationship that's based on not just this implicit, uh, you know, unconscious agreement, you know, saying the same words that your parents said or your grandparents or making a vow that's sort of based on your religion or your culture. It's really being conscious this time. Okay, like, what is it that you really want? What do you want your relationship to really be based on? What do you want your commitment to really be based on? That's really between the two of you. I don't care what it is. You know, I'm just the person who's going to facilitate the conversation. But I think this time it has to be super conscious because we make so many implicit assumptions about what monogamy means. Like, are you going to uh, tell each other every time you masturbate? Is it okay to watch porn? Is it okay to have a best friend at work that you tell 
all your secrets to about your relationship? You know, is it okay to pursue your own interests at the, you know, at the sacrifice of spending time with your children? Like what, what really does it mean to be in a long-term commitment? Because you don't have those conversations when you get married. Right. And unless you're going to totally open up and be transparent about what you need and what you want, you're not really living in integrity, right? You're kind of split off and compartmentalized about what your needs are. And eventually they're going to come out and then it's going to feel like a betrayal. Right. Most people don't talk about, um, you know, when they're newly married or newly committed, they don't talk about, well, what, what, how would we define a betrayal, right? Emotional right. affairs are really a very common way for, for the, you know, for what we call an exit, right? An exit of intimacy, almost like keeping windows open on, when you're trying to heat the house in the winter, you've got these, you've got all the windows open, all these exits we have, right? Ways that we stay out or lean out of the relationship. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it seems like it, it can feel like an uphill battle to be talking to people about using the affair as a way to, 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 to learn about themselves, right? But, but you see it happen all the time. In fact, that's why you, you, write, you wrote your books um, and write about infidelity, that you see that it's possible. Well, and I also wrote when you're the one who cheats. So, because I think that the, the literature out there is all about sort of being the victim of cheating and that therapists are really focused on sort of aligning with the victim and talking about the cheater as the perpetrator. But if the person who's cheated um, gets treated in therapy like they're the bad guy, then we're sort of missing the opportunity to uh, sort of see them as the person that instigates the major change. Now, granted, they got to have the fun part of the major change and the other person gets, the, you know, the not so fun part. Arguably, um, I guess. I mean, some people describe it as a roller coaster, like, whoo, I'm glad this is over. Like, this was really stressful to have, you know, I'm, I have trouble with one <laughs> person and now I've got two or three. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it's stressful. And, and, and I'm sure the person who was cheated on has no sympathy for them. No. Nah. <laughs> and most people who come back from an affair are not really sorry for the affair. They don't regret the actual affair. What they regret is, like you're saying, the stress, um, how they hurt their partner, how they you know, mismanaged their finances or you know, lost their job. or their, And how children are affected. And how the kids are affected, right? Yeah. And the fallout from it. But they don't necessarily say, oh my God, that sucked for me. Usually an affair is great. Like by its nature, it's amazing. Um, but which is why people who've been cheated on never feel like, or I shouldn't say never, many times feel like uh, they're not getting the remorse that they feel like they deserve. Like, how come you're not sorry for what you did? Well, I'm not really sorry for the affair. I'm sorry I hurt you. Um, but I don't necessarily regret what happened because it brought out a part of me that I needed to explore and it, right. it cre created a part of me. And that's part of the problem is that if you decide, okay, I'm going to end the affair and I want to stay in my marriage, you can't necessarily end that part of you and put it back in the box. Because if you do that and it, that part of you goes underground, you're just going to resent your partner for not being able to be all of you in the marriage and you're not going to be able to uh, go back once you've created this this bigger part in your in your character and your personality. Um, eventually, it's going to come back out, and you're either going to have another fare to express it, or you're going to feel like there's no room for growth in your marriage. And it's not necessarily your partner's fault that you can't be that part. Right. And so you have to have a way to integrate that part into your new marriage going forward or else it's not going to work. Right. And these are the things we do. I mean, that's what people ask us to do. And we do every day sort of holding the space. The therapist ends up holding that space. It, it can be really too much to juggle for two people. They've got their own parts that are triggered. Their partner's parts are triggered. They're triggered by triggered parts. <laughs> it's just this. So what we do is kind of guide and sort of help them focus on key pieces one at a time, just take one step. Um, it's interesting what you say about the, you know, having more compassion and seeing the side of the person who cheated and beginning to see it with new eyes and see that there's, you know, 
It's not just we have to get them to remorse or get them to end the affair. There's a, there's a more complex task involved in order to integrate their affair energy with the relationship. What, what would you say is the primary task? I mean, you, you write especially, and you write, you write for both partners, both the partner that has been uh, betrayed and the person who's gone outside the relationship. The person mm-hmm. who's, who's been betrayed, what, what, what's, what are you typically helping them focus on? Well, it depends on what phase we're in. You know, there's there's a really tricky phase where you have to look at collusion. Like, how did how did this affair of your partners work for you? And that's a really hard thing to to do as a therapist. Like you said, like to hold all those parts. One of the ways you could do it is like, you know, okay, this part of your partner came out in the affair. What part of you has come out as a result of your partner's affair? And sometimes people will say, well, I'm much more independent. I'm much, I have a voice now that I didn't have. I realize I can, uh, you know, I'm going to demand more for myself or I want a more sexual relationship than I thought, you know, that person usually finds more of themselves as well. But there's also parts that collude. You know, I, um, I, this, I'm in my second marriage, but in my first marriage, um, my husband had an affair with my best friend. And I realized, you know, I had this story, this narrative for years and years about how he cheated on me. And it was not why our marriage broke up, but I, you know, I had this whole victim mentality for a while. And then I was at an Imago conference and I was speaking in front of like 200 people about affairs. And I realized like it sort of hit me in that moment, like, oh my God, I totally set them up. Like I knew unconsciously, but on some level that I was probably going to end that marriage Mm. and that I set them up so that he would know that a beautiful woman would be attracted to him and he would survive if we got divorced. Wow. And I, I realized as I was talking, as it was coming out of my mouth, I was like, Oh yeah. When she would call me, I would say, Oh, I can't talk. I'm busy with the kids. And I would hand the phone to him or they had things in common that I didn't like to do. They would go skeet shooting and stuff. And I'd be like, Oh yeah, you guys go. I'm going to stay home. Or, you know, I knew that she wanted to sleep with him. Uh I knew he had affairs on her husband all the time. I mean, we were really close and I knew that he was attracted to her and I totally pushed them together. And it made perfect sense when I realized it later that, you know, it was, and I didn't even really know that I was going to leave him at that time, but I knew that this would help his ego defense so that he would realize that he could survive. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that literally was like six or eight years after I got divorced, which was probably 10 years after the, that affair. It took you that long. I mean, it, 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 it it took that long to sort of, let go of the denial or to to bring that to conscious awareness? Yeah, to let go of the righteousness Mm. of look what happened to me. And, you know, and I'm a therapist and I have a PhD and I like have, you know, 20 years of therapy Mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, the expert in the field of, of affairs and that's what it took for me to figure it out. So if you can imagine someone else coming into this brand new to being cheated on, how hard it is to look at your own part in the Mm -hmm. affair because Mm -hmm. you can't blame the victim, right? You Mm -hmm. can't blame the person being cheated on. But people can recognize many times, you know, the part they played. In other words, like I have a a couple where they hadn't had sex for like six years and she said to him, just go out and find someone else to have sex with. Stop bothering me. So he went out and found someone else to have sex with. And then she was like, I can't believe you did that. And he was like, but you told me to. And she was like, but I didn't really mean it. I didn't mean it. <laughs> I didn't think you actually would. You weren't or, supposed to do it. <laughs> or I thought implicitly that you would go out and find a sex worker, not that you would have an affair mm. with someone and actually have feelings for that person. Feel for them, yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of implicit assumptions in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, the, I mean, in that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we get to hear so many stories. I think that's what I, what keeps me hopeful, I think, about when somebody comes into my office. I don't know about you, Tammy, but that we hear the, the combinations of um, 
of struggles, but resilience also with with couples. We get to see how it work can work out, or or sometimes it doesn't. But we get to hear all these stories, like the the, the things that that our walls have heard. Right, the stories. Um, we hear it all. Um, you also do a lot of work on sex and intimacy, and um, you know, I think we can. I, mean, I want to hear your thoughts about some myths about sort of sexual intimacy. But I think one of the one of the myths, probably, I would say. I would offer this is that that affairs uh, happen because of sex. Um, maybe and sometimes and oftentimes there's some sexual intimacy involved, but that 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 ain't what's driving it a lot of the times. Um, I guess I wonder, you know, if we can shift gears a little bit, talk about intimacy and sexual passion, sort of um, separate the subject a little bit. A lot of people come to you for and uh, for the teaching on sexual intimacy. What are what are some of the things you enjoy the most teaching? about sexual intimacy and sexology? Well, I think just to go back for a second about, you know, the myths around sex and affairs. Yeah. There actually are studies that show that women actually do cheat for sex. Men tend to cheat for emotional reasons. And that like flips the whole paradigm of what we think about, about affairs because, you know, there's so many myths around women needing emotional connection and, men just wanting, you know, objectified sex. And frankly, it's not true, particularly as you get to middle age and you have kids that are uh, like kindergarten age. Like women have been nurturers their whole lives. And as they get older, as the kids get older, at school age, um, you know, women don't want necessarily to be in another emotional relationship where they have to listen to their affair partner talk about their rough day at work. They're like, you know, I have that at home. <laughs> I just want to have good sex. Like I don't want to have have to listen to someone else's emotional problems. And for men, many times they're in a relationship where their their partners, their life partners have distanced themselves because they're getting a lot of their emotional satisfaction from their children and they miss it. So they're looking for a more permanent uh, relationship in an affair. And <clears throat> we know that we also know that um, from studies with Steve Stosny and John Gottman that a lot of affairs happen because of opportunity, not because the sex at home is not good. So you can still have good sex and have a good relationship at home and have people cheat. Um, if there's a lot of opportunity and people feel like it's easy and it lands in their lap or like, you know, now when you can do it online, um, and there's nothing better to do and people are bored or like you said, depressed. Okay. Um, but so people really come to me for two reasons when it comes to sex. It's either there's been a, a trauma in their erotic life, like an affair, some kind of infidelity or neglect. And neglect is this you know, sort of myth that if we work on our companionship and we get really close and we communicate well and we go to therapy and learn how to talk to each other, then our sex life will just take care of itself. And that's totally not true. And so people will come in unhappy in their sex life because they haven't really been working on their erotic life. And that's the um, sort of the downfall of a lot of long-term relationships to you know, reevaluate how do you jack up your erotic life. Even if you're really good companions, you're great roommates, you get along, everything's fine, you parent well, you know, they're running the business of your life really well, but you know, you've lost that passion and aliveness and, you know, your sex life sucks and people don't know how to put that first. It's, right. you know, you lose right. interest. Please take the time now to subscribe to the soul of life, wherever you're listening, give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. That's the best way to make sure you don't miss out on these amazing episodes planned for season two. I mean, inhibitions are, are one of the things that you, you talk about and any sex therapist is going to talk about in some way, in some way that is, you know, ironically, it's like if you're talking about it, then you have an inhibition about talking about it, then it creates this double sort of, you have two inhibitions now, right? So, um, you know, hopefully there's a way to talk about it that's disinhibiting and safe. And, um, but um, even, even therapists don't want to talk about it. Like there's, our culture, it seems like has so much shame around talking about it explicitly. We sort of talk about it sort of 
in this sort of almost like vaudeville way, but then to <laughs> actually talk to use language to use the word penis and vagina or or use the the, the language that our couple is using for <laughs> penis and vagina, right? As opposed to what we what we think is the right term to call um, our sexual parts or set parts of the sexual cycle. Um, do you do you run into that also with with therapists not wanting to talk about sex? Well, everyone, you know, calls it intimacy, their, their intimate life, or they're having trouble with intimacy. And so I have to ask them, do you mean sex? Or do you, like, what do, you, what do you actually mean? Playing footsie under the table? That's, <laughs> what are we talking mean, about? Like gazing into each other's eyes? Like, what are you talking about? Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, your point is well taken. Like, even Oprah calls it her vajayjay, you know? Right. <laughs> Can we just very, call it <laughs> what it is? It's very infantilizing, you know, like... Like everyone talks about their parts like they're toddlers mm. because that's what you were taught as a toddler. You're not taught right. the, right. you know, everyone calls their whole vulva, their vagina, like especially girls, like they're not taught any kind of language for parts. And, you know, <clears throat> if, and if you're working with people around sex, you know, you're allowed to say blowjob, like that's okay. But it also depends on, the people that you're working with, how comfortable they feel and what they want to, what they want to talk about. Right. Interestingly, when they're talking about affairs, they're much more likely to use the term blowjob than they are if they're talking about their wives or partners or we'll say oral sex. Hmm. And so it, hmm. it illustrates the point that people separate, you know, it's the, um, it's the Madonna whore complex that we have in our culture that does separate their married or committed partner from their outside partner so that they can uh, project all their sort of toxic fantasies out into an objectified partner and protect their married partner from all their um, erotic desires. Right. And so the goal is to integrate the, all those parts into your married partner so that you can have those ex both those experiences in yourself and in your marriage. It's not mm -hmm. easy, but if you're going to have hot sex, you got to do it. And it, this idea, it seems like we carry around a lot of burden and, and weight around the idea that there's dirty words for sex. There's dirty sex. There's clean. Some, I guess that means there's clean, clean sex. <laughs> I don't know what that mean? What does that mean? Right. But um, it seems like what you teach and talk about a lot and any sex therapist talks about is that these are just experiences. We, you know, there's a way that we, we can begin to take the meaning that we make out of and the judgment um, out of the experience and just notice what the experience is more. Do um, you find that to be the case? Well, I think um, people want to feel safe in a relationship and there is you know, something inherently uh, dangerous about going to those places that threatens your own uh, level of shame. You know, people have so much shame around sex. And so then they have shame around their fantasies and shame around their desires. And the longer you're together in a relationship, you would think the more comfortable you are sharing your desires and your fantasies, but it actually works the opposite because the more you're together, the safer you feel and the more family you feel. And you, know, you don't want to have sex with your family so that, you know, it actually decreases and desexualizes your relationship because you you become sort of parentified and, um, and plus you don't want to risk the safety of a long-term marriage. So you tend to uh, decrease that sexual eroticism, you know, because eroticism by its nature is illicit, it's forbidden, it's naughty, which is why Tension. we split it off. Yeah. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I think Esther Perel talks a lot about that erotic tension, about the need to have separation and boundaries in in spicing things up. Not you know, n not having access to all completely all uh, layers of of a person's life uh, intimately. Sometimes just you know, seeing them in a, in a more erotic way. You see this person as the the mommy, and to your to your children, like it can be difficult to see them in an erotic light as well. But you talk about that quite a bit as well. Well, I think it's not so much being feeling safe, it's learning to trust the person. So, and I know it's sort of the nomenclature is similar, but safety and trust are different. 
So you do have to trust your partner to go to those places, those edges of your erotic desires um, so that you can push your own edge. You know, so you can explore those places without, uh, without feeling shame or risking shame. And you do have to trust that person, but you don't have to feel safe. And there's a difference because in really good sex, you shouldn't feel s- safe. You should feel like kind of embarrassed and you should feel like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. And I can't believe I made that noise. And I can't believe I was that person. And the only way to do that is to feel like you're in a sort of trusting environment. Trust means uh, that you're going to get in the boat, even though it looks scary. Um, Safety means I need to know that the boat is, you know, waterproof and that I need to know that everything is going to be okay before I get in. Are the dishes done? Are the kids in bed? All that stuff that disinhibits us, right? Yeah, or the, you know, in, in, inhibits. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Or that, you know, it's going to be the same sex that we always have and it's not going to do anything different. It's not going to challenge me. And it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's maintenance sex and it's going to mm-hmm. be fine. It's going to be lovely, but it's not going to push any edges and it's not going to challenge me at all. Right. And I mean, just to be clear, you're speaking about, I think, the, the, the physiology, right, of the body that an orgasm is by definition an involuntary reflex. And so the more we're trying to create it, we deal with, you know, we, t- we talk about a guy, some, if it's a guy who comes in and says he's struggling with uh, erectile dysfunction or having confidence issues, uh, maintaining an erection um, or getting one, that often it's about trying to trust your body and sort of let go as opposed to do the right thing in a certain order, <laughs> be the right way. That there's a physio- physiological component to, to this, right? Well, yeah. And then same for women. Like you can't have an orgasm unless you really trust what's happening and you can relax into it. Otherwise, you know, any anxiety, most sexual dysfunction is based on anxiety. So erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, Mm -hmm. anorgasmia, or the inability to orgasm. A lot of it, unless it's medication based, a lot of it's based on anxiety. So if you could trust to really relax and let go, a lot of that will take care of itself. But it's a bad cycle. So once you're anxious that you have erectile dysfunction or that you can't get an erection, then the next time you're going to feel like, oh no, that happened last time. So it's probably going to happen this time. And that just creates the problem again and again. So you get stuck in that anxiety cycle. Um, But you know, the more you have a uh, trusting relationship with your partner and you're not so focused on getting to the end zone and it's not such a performance and you could focus just on pleasure in the moment and not have to worry about getting anywhere, the more likely you are to break out of that. Right. So that's really the goal. Right. Are, there, are there favorite myths that you like? Or maybe that's not the right way to say it, Tammy. What are your favorite things that you like to teach about or what, what energizes you um, teaching about sex? Um, I think there's a couple things. One is... Uh, when we're talking about getting over any kind of betrayal, excuse me, <clears throat> the idea is not to focus on forgiveness as the goal. Forgiveness is, is, is an organic process that will happen over time. The goal is really erotic recovery. So in all those cases where it's neglect or betrayal, um, erotic recovery means that you get to a place where the sex is... Um, going to bring that passion and aliveness back to the relationship. And once that eroticism, erotic energy is in the relationship, it's not split off outside the relationship. It heals a lot of things. If you don't work on the erotic recovery, then you're stuck. Because forgiveness is a, it's a power struggle, right? If you have an affair and you say, I'm sorry, now I owe you forgiveness. And then we're at a, you know, we're a log jam unless I give you the forgiveness. Otherwise, we can't move forward. But if I give you forgiveness, now you got to have the affair. Now you get the forgiveness too, and I have nothing. And so, you know, at times where I feel like the relationship is imbalanced, I'm going to take back my forgiveness and say, you know what, today I don't forgive you because I need something. <laughs> and so forgiveness is really a power struggle until until there's empathy. And when there's empathy on both sides, then 
um, then we can sort of work towards the erotic recovery. And then that, uh, that third person will be out of the bedroom. But right. until that erotic recovery is strong enough, um, the, all the other stuff will work itself out when that happens. But until then, then you're just going back and forth and back and forth. And why did this happen? And what happened? And how many right. times did you sleep right. with her? Right, right. I, I wish we had more time, or maybe we can do this another time, Tammy. But to, but the the sequence that I'm sort of catching, which I, I I get and I and I I follow this actually is that especially in a committed partnership, a long term partnership, the sequence sort of goes intimacy or emotional connection, then eroticism. But obviously, some partners connect erotically, and then the empathy follows. Or then we could even talk about sort of kink and sort of what used to be called um, like dysfunctional f- modes of arousal, right? Which we'd no longer use that term. We're, and I wanted to ask you about the term sex positive, what that means. Some people, that would be a new term for them. For a lot of therapists, it was, would not be a new term. But can you say something about what sex positivity is in our field and, and how it relates this idea of um, you know, whether we prioritize certain types of intimacy, if it's going to be you know, connection-based sex or as Terry Real, I think, talks about disconnected sex versus connect, connected sex. Well, first of all, uh, you know, like you were saying before, some people need to feel emotionally connected to have sex and other people feel emotionally connected from having sex. So that's how people get stuck in, you know, sexual shutdowns because usually you end up with a partner who has that opposite need. It's not necessarily male, female, but it, it can be. It just depends. So if you need to feel emotionally connected to have sex, but your partner feels emotionally connected from having sex, then it can feel like if you don't have sex with me, then you don't want me. And that could feel like not just you're not in the mood for sex, but you don't love me, like you don't want me. And I think we underestimate that impact on people when, especially men and women come in for therapy and the guy typically is upset because their sex life or their desire discrepancy is that, you know, she doesn't want to have sex. And we focus so much on, okay, well, let's get you connected emotionally so that she can feel comfortable having sex while we ignore his need to have a sexual relationship in order to feel emotionally connected. And I I think we're uh, not doing anybody any favors doing that. I I think as a field of therapy, we tend to be more feminized and focused on emotional needs and attachment. And we, we're we discounting that other side of the equation where, um, you know, sex can be a language of love. And it's not necessarily just putting tab A into slot B or else they would just masturbate or go find someone outside. Right. Right. But the need to be with their partner is super strong. And... So that's part of being sex positive. The other part is that there's really no normal when we talk about sex. You know, normal is a setting on the washing machine. It doesn't really mean anything. And we have to be careful as therapists that we don't judge people's sexuality through our own lens of, you know, if you're doing something kinkier than me, then you're freaky. And if you're not, if you're doing something that's more vanilla than me, then you need to like ratchet it up a little, get some spicy thing going on there. Um, so, but sex positive is like trying not to judge other people's sexuality based on this vague idea of what is normal. So unless someone is uh, really hurting from their own sexual behavior or hurting someone else without permission or consent, then um, there's a range of sexual behaviors that has nothing to do with what we think is okay. And so you know, the idea is also the last part of it is that sex is an important and um, priority focus part of a committed relationship. And that the, the piece that I think is important that I talk about is that it's also part of a, a monogamous relationship that one of the things you commit to when you're committing to marriage or monogamy is to be sexual partners And that if you're not going to have sex with your partner, it's not okay to hold them hostage and say, well, I don't want to have sex with you, but you can't have sex with anyone else either. And that's really a betrayal as well. 
And, you know, how long can you go without having sex with your partner and yet refusing them to have sex with anyone else before your partner says, hey, this is a, this is breaking the agreement that we have as well. Right. And, and it's, it's sort of sobering even to think of like the definition of a sexless marriage being less than two, two times a month. Or, and, and I hate to get into numbers. People always ask how, how much, what's the normal amount of sex people have, right? It's kind of a ridiculous question, but. Um, you know, the bar is, the bar is up there. It should be like, we think of in, in sex therapy, we think of it as, um, having some sort of sexual vibrancy, right. Mm -hmm. th throughout the, throughout the week. Um, Tammy, um, is there anything that you wanted to speak about that, that you want people to, to know about projects you're working on or where they can find you and get in touch with you? Um, they can definitely come to my website, uh, drtammynelson.com, drtammynelson.com. They can find my podcast at The Trouble With Sex or any place that they can listen to podcasts. If they want training as a sex therapist or a sex and couples therapist, they can go to Integrative Sex Therapy Institute or isdtraining.com. We have, uh, you know, sessions throughout the year or they can sign up for the whole program. Um, if people are listening and they want to... Uh, email me directly and tell me that they were listening on this show. I'll give them a free handout from my book, 37 Questions for Their New Monogamy Agreement. So get in touch with you um, through your website. Let them know that you were listening on The Soul of Life. And, and Tammy's mm -hmm. going to give you a great tool that can help you with your, your relationship. That's fantastic. Thank you, Tammy. Um, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, your books are When You're the One Who, Who Cheats, 10 Things You Need to Know, and The New Monogamy, Redefining Your Relationship After Infidelity, and of course, Getting the Sex You Want. Tammy, thank you so much. It's been a real treat to see you today. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Soul of Life. This is Keith Miller. Oh, and don't forget, please leave a thumbs up or a like for this episode wherever you're listening so that others like you may find the soul of life. I mean, really, it's not every day you get to share the soul of life with someone. Okay, so you can post a comment or question on souloflifeshow.com. I'd love to hear from you. And please subscribe now to get the next episode. I look forward to sharing more of my soul of life with you. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go.